How's it going everybody and welcome back to another pool coaching video. In today's video, I am joined by none other than Demetrius from MN Pool Boot Camp. What's going on, bud? Uh, you're what's going on, Chris. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you here, man. Um, how you been? Have you been busy? Yeah, yeah. I uh, I want to thank all the supporters out there that have, uh, thanks to your stream, I've, I've got a lot of inquiries and it's been a very busy, uh, very busy time. I got a lot of boot camps lined up. For those that don't know, uh, I run three day pool boot camps uh, here in Minnesota. Uh, distance isn't an issue because people fly in from all over and just we just work on pool for three days. But I want to shout out real quick too to Matt Kitzman. Uh, Matt was uh, a gentleman that submitted a pool review video several months ago, and uh, after after reviewing his video, we connected, and uh, he actually came up last weekend, which is uh, a, a great opportunity, and it was such a treat. After two days, uh, by the end of day two, he looked like an entirely different player at the table, and I'm glad that uh, I'm glad he flew home, so I don't have to play him up here. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, those things are going good. That's awesome because I can definitely piggyback off of that. After taking uh, your boot camp, people have started to notice that my game is a little different. Uh, they they can't really pinpoint exactly what it is, which I think is good. Uh, they just happen to notice that there's something really different uh, about my game and the way that I actually uh, play the patterns. But as we get back to the video here, we have Andrew Jaworski from Jaworski Pool Practice. He has his own YouTube channel, and I'll put a link in the description below so you can go check out his pool channel and make sure to give him a subscription. He has given us three eight ball racks that we're going to review. And I'm going to spoil this a little bit. He's actually done really well through all three of these racks, which is the reason why I brought in Demetrius to get some top level advice throughout each of these racks. So this is pretty much going to be Demetrius's show. And then I'm just going to try to piggyback off of anything that he says afterwards. So, Demetrius, are you ready to go? I was born ready. All right. Then let's begin. All right. Well, we're going to dive right into rack one, see how Andrew handles this. Always like, uh, always like rooting for the guy when you know he's going to run out because it's like watching a movie where you know the good guys are going to win. How is he going to get out of this one? <laughs> So now uh, I've been informed that he is playing the NEA rules, which means that it will be an open table after the break, regardless of whether he makes, you know, how many he makes of each suit. He is free to claim which object ball group he wants. So let's take a look and see how he hits them. All right. That was interesting. It looks like he used a side break, uh, Normally when people break second, usually they break second ball when they use a side break. It looks like he, I might have seen that wrong, but I thought he thinned the head ball. So anyway, he managed to make a ball. It looks like there is, everything's kind of floated apart, but there's still a lot of congestion. So it'll be interesting. This will be a fun rack to watch. I don't think he has a good shot at a stripe. So it looks like he's taking solids here. He's going to try to go into the seven. He did move the seven um, where it landed. It has pockets, but Everything's kind of, it's going to be tense. So he's shooting quick. Um, he's, it looks like he's going to be shooting the four on the side. He's a little hampered here. So let's see. This will be interesting to see his elevated bridge. Good shot. That's not an easy shot to put yeah, down. Really good shot. Now this three ball, it looks like this is, he's on the three. And the only shot he can really get on, the seven doesn't pass the two. The two is a problem. Um, he can, it looks like he's going around the table off the end rail, off the side rail, off the other end rail. That's a good shot. And he's on either the one or the six or yeah, but you can't really look at the seven here. So then this is tough. This is getting on the two ball and this, this is a lot of uh, challenges here. He could, he could either, you know, he could try to move the two. That's pretty haphazard. You could, you could try to send the cue ball into the 15 and just tickle them all open. He's shooting the six. Ooh. I think I think he might have been trying to go forward for the one in the corner. Um, and he's, I mean, he's on the one in the corner. That's his only shot now, but this is a doozy. I guess he makes this ball because we know that he makes it. So this is, um, 
What a shot. I mean, that, that worked out because that could have went all kinds of wrong. Boy, I, that's, a, that's a heck of a shot. I'll tell you that. Okay, he's looking at making the seven, and now he's looking at this two ball. Is he going to shoot the two, or is he looking at where he wants to be? Well, he's, now he's taking time. I always wonder. Okay, but now he's taking time. So now... Look at this. Look at this shot. And he got on the seven. That was not so easy to get on that ball. That was a really good shot. Now this is going to be... Yeah, this is going to be tough to get on the eight. The eight doesn't go on the side or either corner. So it only goes... Where does the eight go? It goes in the side or it goes in the two corner pockets. But he's running into these balls... Um, if he draws, he's kind of coming over to the side rail. Um, maybe he can draw to the side rail and then back across table. But if he hits, can he, is he, can he get by the 15? Well, we'll see. Okay, he gets down. He's queuing low inside. Ooh, wow. Wow. That was a really good shot. Could have <laughs> used a little bit more speed so he could just be a little straighter on the eight in the side, but still doable. Boy, that's not one. If you, uh, if you ask him, I don't think he'd want to shoot it again. I think you'd take that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a shot. But you're right. Now he's queuing low as he's drawn into the nine then to kind of kill the rock. Yes, he is. Two for Ooh, one. Okay. Well, man, that was actually really well done. Do you actually have a couple of things we can comment on? Yeah, you know, well, first of all, I mean, great shooting, Andrew. That's uh, bombs away. You made a bunch of hard shots and showed a lot of knowledge and skill to get through that rack. Uh, most of those shots are not in <laughs> not in every pool player's arsenal, so very impressive. Okay, cool. But, uh, yeah, I do see a few things that we can talk about, so maybe we should take a closer look. All right, let's have a look at them. All right. So, Andrew, I want to talk about first rack, and I want to talk about the first shot, I should say. Uh, you have a shot at the five ball, which I, I like this as an opening shot because the problem balls in this rack are the seven and the two ball. Uh, to me, these look like the problems. The six is not real friendly, but really, to me, it's the seven ball. Of course, the seven ball is the ball that maybe most wants to be moved if you're going to move it. So, what I saw on this is that you, when you shot this, you shot fairly quick and you nudged this ball right to about here. And the cue ball got wedged kind of half elevated over this little stripe cluster. Uh, my, my initial thought was, okay, you moved the seven a little bit. And I think you wanted to move it only a little so that you didn't tie it up with the eight or you didn't set it somewhere haphazard. And I like that. Like you're not just going to smash open a cluster and hope that you get lucky. The only problem is where that ball ended up. It actually made things kind of tough because it actually took away this pocket for the two ball. And it made it very difficult to ever get on the two ball in the side pocket, which are a couple of places where it went before your seven ball shot. And then from where you got, um, what ends up happening is after your first shot, I, I can't really be too critical of anything you did because you made a good shot on the four on the side. You made a great shot on the three to go three rails and get on the one six, uh, got a little bit, you know, stand on the one ball after shooting the six and then had to go into these two balls and move stuff around. But the way I kind of look at it. So, you, you know, you really executed well to run out that remainder of the rack. The way I look at runouts though, is I always ask myself, I grade a run out, not as a pass fail, but as how many difficult shots did you have to make to run that rack? And how many difficult transitions did you have to make? And, and looking at that rack, you had to make a very difficult shot on the one ball that then cut up the rail. And you had to make a couple of very difficult transitions from the two to the seven, the seven, the eight. Um, even if you'd gotten more full on the one ball, so it wasn't as difficult of a shot, uh, it was still going to be very hard to deal with the two seven. And there was a lot of difficulty created later in the rack because of where that seven, two kind of started. So to me, what I would like to see is on this opening shot, while I generally don't like to move the balls haphazardly, I think you could pocket this five. And I think I would have played to go into the seven ball fairly full, but with a little bit more speed or maybe a little bit on the far side of the seven. 
because my goal would be to kick the seven ball either further this way, you know, somewhere, even I'm not too worried about exactly. I don't want it to go towards the eight. I want it to like go up table. And then if you could kick the seven ball up table, then if you look at where the cue ball stops, I'd really be trying to play my cue ball off the seven, or even if it could dribble through the seven, I would love to be able to get on this two ball on the side, because if you can kick the seven further up and get on the two ball on the side, then you might be able to run these balls with no difficult trouble balls, no difficult transitions, no difficult shots. And when I think about it, like in the long run, yes, you ran through this rack and there's no question. You're a very strong player, but match after match, rack after rack, tournament after tournament, uh, the person that gambles the least is going to win. And so I think that if you try to move the seven and get on the two, if it doesn't work, you then you go do what you did. But I think that at least you got to give yourself the free roll, give yourself the chance to have an easy rack. I really feel like if you hit the good part of the seven here, then the rack is over. Um, and you got to give yourself that chance to make these racks a little bit easier uh, to have the percentages working for you. And I think that it could have just been a little bit more care. You shot this very quickly. And I don't think you saw that, that this one shot here could eliminate all of the difficulty in the remainder of the rack. So that's, that's what jumped off the page for me. Um, but, um, you know, again, don't want to be critical with the guy that shoots as straight as you. It's not that that was bad. I just want you to hit all your pool goals and not just most of them. What do you got there, Chris? Um, interestingly enough, I don't think the five ball is a good opening shot. I actually see a different type of pattern here that doesn't really require like any type of breakouts. Um, I don't think there's really any hard transitions except for maybe one, but I think one hard transition is still better than the multiple hard transitions that he has here. And that's with this six ball. I think that if he would have just shot the six ball into the bottom right corner pocket, he can draw the cue ball back if he wants, but basically he wants to get position on this one ball next. Because like you said, the two ball can go either here into the side pocket, and it does look like it passes up here to go into the um, upper left corner pocket. So when I shoot this one ball next, that's pretty much what I'm trying to play position for. Shoot the one ball into the same corner pocket, and then try to dribble the cue ball forward and land on either right in line with the shot of the two ball or on its left side. Because I don't want to get too far forward to where I'm going to run into the 15. Because if I shoot the two ball into the corner pocket, I have a simple transition or rather simple transition for the three ball into this corner pocket. Play position for the five. The seven ball freely goes down here. So that's why I would leave the five ball to transition to the seven. Because then from the seven, look, we have the four ball right here. And then the eight ball still freely goes into the side pocket like he did. Now, I think the only tricky part comes is this one to the two, because you do, like I said, have to land rather perfect. Otherwise, you're going to shoot the two in and possibly run into the 15. And you can get in all kinds of trouble. So maybe we can also bypass the two if we wanted and go all the way up to where we play position for the three ball instead. Still do a three, five, seven, and then from the seven, play the two and then try to get position on the four. I just think either one of those patterns there to me, just looks simpler because I'm not moving any balls around. I'm just shooting and getting decent position on the next shot. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I like it. I, it. When I first saw this, I thought he was a little thin on the six to do that, but he is playing on a, a you know on a bar table and it, the pockets are you know flexible. So you can take advantage of that and, and take a little bit of pressure off your patterns and cue ball movement by using those pockets that way. Uh, I think it kind of comes down to a question of, which is going to be more finicky getting from the one to the two or three getting then from the five to the seven and then from the seven to that two later on, or just opening up the seven right now and, and getting on the two right now. To me, I feel like I'm staring at this and I'm just like, let me at the table. I guarantee you, I can, this is how I feel. I'm not saying I guarantee I can do it, but I feel like, man, let me at it. I can, I can send that seven ball, you know, past the eight towards that 14 where it bumps and has an open pocket or gets past it. I can get my cue ball to hit the seven full and get on the two. And I, and I feel like I win right there and I eliminate any finicky transitions later by doing that. And I also like it doing it right away because then, then if I'm wrong and I do screw something up, I still got all my soldiers left on the table where I can maybe work a new pattern. So I, I kind of like solving all my problems on this first shot with a well-executed stun, but 
uh, I can't argue with what you're saying. They're both, they're both reasonable. Um, and they, I think they both, yeah, they both have a lot of merit. Okay, cool. So I hope that's helpful. And I think we do have one more spot uh, that we can look at on this rack. So let's go take a look at that. All right. The final spot I wanted to mention in this first rack was the way that you played position from the two ball to the seven uh, in the game. You shot the two ball on the side here and you played one rail to here with a, a bit of a stun shot with a little bit of right spin and sent the cue ball one rail this way here for the seven in the corner. And I'll tell you, uh, when I first saw this, the, the, the only thing about this is that you're kind of coming across the shot line. Uh, you could get behind the 14, you could run into the 14, you could scratch the side. So my inclination was to see you use just a little bit of a, a little bit of a stun draw where you're a little bit deeper than the tangent line and then, and then a little bit more right spin so that you can follow a two rail path here, here, and then off the second rail towards the seven ball shot line. I mean, really the final spot you're looking to get is a little bit, it's very similar to where you actually got in the end. The differences are you take out the chance, well, you really reduce the chances of a scratch or a hook. Uh, and also you make the landing zone much bigger. Uh, instead of having a line from here to here to stop in, which is like what, I don't know what that is, two feet. Uh, instead, once you clear this line here, you can hit the seven and have a shot. And then you're after you bump off this rail, which by the way, acts like brakes because it slows the cue ball down. Then you've got like a nice three foot strip or two and a half foot strip where you're just getting better and better on that seven ball. So to me, it seems like you're very seldom going to get hooked. Uh, and you've got probably twice the landing strip to get a shot. The only thing, and I, maybe you saw this, and maybe there's a, a subtlety I'm missing, which is maybe it's possible that if what you're trying to do is get on the right side of the shot line, you know, if what you're really trying to do is go all out to get perfect here on the seven so that you can make the seven and follow over for the eight in the side, uh, there's really no way to do that with my two rail route. So the one rail route you shot, does have the potential to where if you just absolutely gin it, you can land on the right side of the shot line. So maybe that's what you were thinking is, hey, I really want to get exactly where that circle is. But that's pretty ambitious. And so when I first saw this, I, I, I really it was screaming at me to just play two rails. I think it's better to get a good shot at the seven than it is to, uh, to risk the inning trying to get to that exact circle. So what are your thoughts, Chris? Uh, sure. There was actually um, a spot right before he actually got down and shot this. I'm going to try to find it right here. This movement right here makes me believe that he's thinking about shooting the seven ball and he's seeing where the cue ball is going to land in order for him to be able to shoot the two ball. And I'm thinking if that's what he's going to get, this is the pattern that he should be playing. He should be playing that seven ball into the corner pocket from here. And it looks like he probably would put some draw with a little bit of left spin pull the cue ball over to here and then back out along this line where he has his cue ball and then do the same exact two rail position that he or that you're suggesting because he'll end up landing over here for the eight ball right into the upper left corner pocket because even with the two rail position that we saw like you said if he does not land on the good side of this shot line he has to do that amazing in uh, low inside two rail position for the eight in the in the opposite side pocket or if he's at least right here with the two rail route, he can probably push past the seven, clip off the 15, hit the rail, and then come back over here. I think that would be another possibility that he could have been able to do with the two rail route, shooting the two ball like uh, like you had suggested. Getting closer to the seven makes that a much bigger possibility, but further away from it, especially the way he lands, only allows him to do the route that he did because otherwise he's hitting that 15 ball full and he doesn't have a positional shot on the eight ball at all. But my thought would so be what I hit the seven. Yeah. Ball. Yeah. What I hear you saying is to say it this way, when you're playing the two to get on the seven, you not only have to get on the seven, you have to get on the seven to where you can somehow get on this trouble ball, which the eight is actually a trouble ball. Whereas if you shoot the seven first and then shoot the two to get on the eight, it's not that much harder to get on the eight from the two ball. And you don't have the challenge of having to play shape for another ball. So all you have to do is obtain a shot as opposed to obtaining a perfect angle or making a great shot after. Exactly. I think the only thing he has to worry about when he shoots the seven ball is making sure that the cue ball does not get stuck on the rail. 
uh, because then he only has access to the top side of the uh, the cue ball. He definitely wants to have the cue ball bump off of the rail and land, you know, maybe even half a diamond away from the rail. That should give him plenty of enough access to be able to do some sort of two railer, just like we were talking about earlier, and get position on the eight for the upper left corner pocket. Although it's possible that he could lay draw the cue ball. I know he can draw the cue ball to the third diamond where he's standing or close to the second and a half diamond. Anyway, my point is he could roll the two ball in. He could just roll it in, dribble towards the 11 a little bit and shoot the eight in the corner where he's standing by. I mean, this this is a bar table. Even if he went to the kitchen line, I mean, I'd rather have that shot on the eight ball for the kitchen. I'd rather make the seven, roll the two and shoot the eight for the kitchen line than have to bomb this two in, get on the seven and then draw around that cluster. So anyway, just, yeah, some... Some good ideas, I guess, to just kind of minimize the amount of difficult transitions. So, yeah. So, Andrew, it's like I said, it's not like you did anything wrong, but hopefully at least with these uh, two little tidbits that we were able to offer you, uh, this can uh, just like open up some different opportunities uh, the next time you happen to look at a rack like the one that you have here. So with that being said, let's take a look at the next rack. All right. Here we go. Kicking off rack two. Let's see if uh, and we know Andrew's going to keep it going. And uh, let's see what he's got. All right, breaking the same way. He had good results last time. Oh, wow, look at the spread. Okay, so he, I know he made a ball three, six, nine, seven 12, ball. 14. Yep, so he made one ball. And let's see here. So it's open table, so he can pick stripes or solids. He has definitely a shot at the stripe, and he's already shooting. Okay, and... Okay, he drew into that. Okay, so he made the first ball. And um, so now he's he's a, you know, everyone has their own pace. He's a quicker player than I am uh, because I, I like to kind of have a plan for all my trouble balls before I start shooting. Uh, he's got a few. That 10 ball is kind of a challenging ball. And now those other two stripes only have one pocket. They do lead to the fifth, the 14. Oh, that was a nice stunt. He stunned across table. He's making short work of this. He's got on the right side of these two stripes. That 14 does go on the side, and then that eight ball would go in the corner if that 14 might be a good key ball. I'm curious how he's going to deal with that 10. Um, maybe that, maybe he can use the nine to get on the 10. He really and cinched then, that one. Yeah, yeah, he, he kind of smoothed it. So I think he can leg this in and then use the – maybe he can get on the 10 right here. Oh, he floated over, and yep, he did get on the 10. Um, and he's not only that, he's even on the right side of the shot line where he can kind of stun over for the 14. And yep. now he needs to get very much either straight or just slightly, yeah. I think he could go all the way to the side rail here and come towards it. Oh, he just drew straight across. That's perfect. He got perfect on this ball. Wow, he made quick work of this rack. Um, he did it, Yeah. And he knew it. There was no accident. There was a lot of planning that went into this. Oh, look at that shot. <laughs> he kind of stun followed it over. Well. He got that one. <laughs> he got that one. That's basically two breaking no, runs I uh, in a row. Yeah, I'll tell you what, he's found that was a very, you can see that was a very powerful break. And uh, he's he's definitely a confident shooter and he's got all the tools. And so he's just uh, full speed ahead. It's uh, going to take more than that to slow him down. But um, yeah, let's uh, let's take a close look. Chris, let's uh, see if we can't find something to nitpick because we can't just let anyone go home feeling like, <laughs> you know, good about themselves, you know? All right. Sounds good. Let's have a look. All right. So and once again, we find ourselves at the beginning of the rack. I really feel that the first shot of the rack is more important. Like I, to me, that's the most important shot of the rack. And it's funny, Chris, you know, I hear a lot of times I'm at a tournament and people are like, Oh, you know, I can't believe it. I was up, you know, three to two. I had a chance to go up four to two and I missed this eight. I missed that eight. I missed this eight. People always remember missing the eight, but I rarely hear somebody walk up and say, you know what? I was at this tournament. I was up three to two and, I played a little bit of a loose first shot and couldn't get on my trouble ball right away. And it kind of cost me like somehow people don't really put the same priority on that. And so it's not that people don't want to play good or they don't want to, you know, make the right shot. But I really feel that if they understood the priority that, that the first shot allows you to make the eight more often. 
And so I'd really like to see Andrew, I'd really like to see you just take a little bit of time to have a, a really clear plan. Now, as it turns out, hard for me to critique that because actually your plan makes a lot of sense. I like what you're trying to do as far as you got to make the 15, you got to make your first shot, get control of the table. And then I like drawing into the 13, nine, those are your only trouble balls besides the 10, but by, by drawing into them, you have a chance to open those up a little bit and get on that 10 right away, which kind of solves the rack. Um, it would be really nice to be able to do that because then you could leave the 11, 12 for the end of the rack where they'd serve as great key balls for the eight, uh, which is, you know, might be a, might be a good opportunity to have a good key ball. You ended up leaving the 14 to the side, uh, which is probably your second best key ball. So that makes sense. Okay. So the only thing I'd say about this breakout is you shot it really quick. So you, it didn't seem like you had the same emphasis that I might've had as far as going into these balls and getting a shot of the 10 when I'm done to eliminate that problem ball. And then the other thing is the speed. Uh, you really swung into this. And I, it, what comes to mind is something that uh, Robert Burns said. He said, um, save your power for when you're breaking open larger clusters with a group of balls. When you're separating two balls, a nudge will do it. And you already know this because the way you hit the seven ball last rack, which ironically was the one where I told you you should have hit it harder. So I know, <laughs> I know, but there's a different situation here. This time, a light touch is what we need to get on our problem ball. Last time, a little bit firmer was what we needed to get on our problem ball. So I'm being consistent with what my goal is, which is not just to separate these, but to get a shot at the 10 uh, and just bump them around a little bit. Because the way you ripped into these, had you hit the 13, you know, maybe it ties up with something else, the four ball, maybe you don't get a shot at the 10. So I was, I was just envisioning a little nudge. And then when I saw your power stroke, um, I just, I was surprised. So anyway, that was really the only thing that I saw, because after that, I think you played this rack beautifully, Chris. I actually have a little bit more uh, to go off of uh, this opening shot, because I do agree with everything that you just said, but let's go into one finer detail. And that's this. I'm going to play this shot frame by frame and watch the 15 ball because right there, I actually think he cut this to where it catches the short rail and then bobbles its way in. So th he, he actually cut the ball in when he's got basically the entire pocket that he can actually work with. Because if I play this further, because then we see this draw effect to where he actually clips the 13 ball rather than coming full or fuller into the 9 and 13. So if we go back, I would rather see that, like you said, if he takes his time, changes the pace a little bit, he should have been able to hit this 15 ball a little bit fuller to where instead of having the cue ball drag its way like this and clipping the 13, it comes more like this and hits the 13 like this, which pretty much is going to halt the cue ball right here, and you can automatically deal with the 10 ball pretty much immediately. And then, like you said, I think the rack is pretty much solved um, right after that. The run out pattern is going to be a little bit different, but it's still solvable uh, from there. And the trouble spot, which is the 10 ball, we all agree it is the 10 ball, it's automatically gone. We already know uh, Andrew knows how to move the cue ball around, and so once the trouble spot is uh, dealt with, everything else should just be smooth sailing. Would you agree with that? Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, and I just – I know Andrew knows how to do this, but you know what? Let me show the viewers that might not. The right way to do this um, is if you're shooting the 10 ball from around where that 13 is, you'd want to play that with like a, a high inside so that you're going to shoot the 10. The cue ball is then going to hit the bottom side of the six and go to the side rail. And then with a little bit of right spin, you can have it so that the cue ball comes to the side rail, hits the end rail somewhere around where the 15 is, and then floats back towards where the 13 is. So you could actually end up kind of where you started again. Uh, the only other thing on that shot is when you're playing the 10 and billiarding into the six, you don't want it to tie up with the uh, set the 12 yes. on the side rail there. Uh, you don't want it to tie up with the 12 or kick into the 12 where the 12 could then, you know, tie up with the 11. So when you shoot that high inside three railer uh, off the 10 ball, you want to, I'd probably play it with a center right so that I can really pop into that six pretty good and make sure that I knock the six to the rail sooner than the 12 and that the 12, the six kicks up table between the one, three somewhere. So that's what, that's the shot for those that don't know it. Uh, that's a good one. It comes up all the time. in straight pool in one pocket where you're shooting, uh, you're shooting the cut shot and then billiarding off the ball and using inside English to kind of spin back off the end rail and back up into play. 
So you're talking about something that after he makes the 15 ball and he breaks this um, open a little bit fuller and the cue ball is here and, and like who knows, like these two balls are like here and here. You play the 10 ball here with that high inside like you said to where when you hit this six, you want the six to do something like this to get out of the way. But your cue ball is going to do something like this. Is that yeah, what you know what? To? That's what I originally. That's what I originally saw. The only thing is, maybe I was mis. Yeah, that is exactly what I was. Thank you. That's exactly the out I was looking at. The only thing is, if you're going into the six really full, which maybe you are, looking at the monitor, you know, maybe maybe you're going really full into the six. Maybe you could just stop and knock the six to the rail and out, and just stop right where the six is and play the eleven up at the corner and then the twelve next. So I, when I first looked at it, I thought he was clipping the bottom side of the six. But if you could, you might just be able to run into the six and stop full. So I, I might have missed that. Okay. Well, cool. Um, I do know there was one other spot that you wanted to take a look at. So let's go have a look at that. All right, Andrew. My uh, other comment from the rack, I am going to do something never before done on a Minnesota pool boot camp review, which is, you know, I've got to applaud you for this, this maneuver. This is stunning. Now you've demonstrated, listen, I, I've been a little bit uh, hypercritical because that's what we're here to do. But, I mean, you've got great rhythm. You obviously see the patterns extremely quickly. Uh, you you have all the shots. You're moving your cue ball around with tremendous uh, resources. This here is the best shot of this rack and maybe my favorite shot of the video. You recognize, I mean, you've got a lot of problems to deal with. This uh, The two stripes that are kind of tied up, the 10 ball. But you recognize that if you stopped on this ball, you could shoot a stun shot of this 12 down the rail and stun the cue ball directly across table towards the four, land on those two stripes, which go short side on this corner by the 10 ball, and then run the table exactly the way you did it. So you saw it and then you executed it to perfection. And my favorite shot is the way you stunned across table from the 12. You know, it's just, it's just, maybe it doesn't look like much, you know, for, for the, you know, but it's to me, that's a really pretty shot when you run a ball down the side rail with just that smooth stun and send the cue ball directly across the table, following the tangent line and, and, and just to see it and to hit it this way, it just solved the racket. If you didn't hit it that way, you know, if you'd run into the 14, for example, if you didn't cue low enough and you ran into the 14, or if you queued too low, it got behind the four or into the side and didn't get on those stripes or scratched, it would have been run over. And instead you got perfect, solved the entire rack. Chris, can you roll it? I just want people to appreciate how smoothly he gets from the 11 to the 12 to these two stripes. So he's got the perfect angle. He doesn't have to cue firm, but nor does he have to baby his stroke. Of, you know, he's got a perfect angle for this and he knows exactly how to do this. And he slides right across and boom, he's on these two stripes and the rest of, and then he hits a very nice leg here too. It's never, uh, you know, it's never easy to use a good, comfortable speed here. And uh, anyway, I just thought he navigated this so well. Uh, we don't have to watch the whole run again, but uh, great, great shooting, Andrew. Really seriously good shooting. Well, awesome job there. So, yeah, uh, just like before, you know, when you're breaking and running racks, you know, there's really not a whole lot to critique on. But, you know, hopefully with the stuff that we're able to nitpick, you know, you can still be able to find useful and apply. So this is going to be it for rack two. And now let's check out your final rack. All right. Well, we've had two break and runs. Time to see rack three if Andrew has a hat trick in him. All right. Oh, he's, uh, he's going head on, head on, smash. Look at this explosion. Oh, my goodness. Three, six, nine, 12, 15. It's a dry That's break. unbelievable. He got the... He got the biggest explosion and nothing went in. That's, uh, I don't know, man. That's some universal uh, bad karma or something. I don't know. Okay, so he's at the table. He's got, man, these balls are open. So he's got this 12 ball and then, or the nine, if he wants stripes. Otherwise, he could take salads, but maybe the one's a trouble ball. He's eyeing up stripes, so he's going to play stripes. So when you shoot this shot here, it's important to get another shot. Uh, let's see. Did he? Yeah, I, I think he's got 13. And if he's gone to 13, this rack is um, going to be another piece of pocket billiards history. <laughs> or he's got the 14. Okay. 
All right. He was fine there. Yeah, and he's good, too. He he landed on this 10 ball. He's good. He can get by the two. He's not going to move anything. Now he actually managed to get on the 11, which is nice. Um, that and then... Uh, I don't see any issues here. No, no. I think he might have been trying to get across for the 13, but it doesn't matter. He's got the 15 to get him on either the 9 or the 13. And originally I was thinking the 9 was a trouble ball because uh, ball's in the middle of the table, but it looks like it goes to the corner. And with uh, a 7-foot table with forgiving pockets, that's uh, not a bad spot to play it. Oh, okay. He's fine. He's fine. Might have overdrawn that just a little bit, but still doable. Yeah. Yep. That's the closest thing we can say, Andrew, is you're almost making a couple. There's been a couple times when you almost made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> we have to dig. We have to dig pretty deep here. Okay. Well, look at this. Third run out in a row. And uh, that's how it's done, folks. Yeah. So two uh, break and runs and a rack and run. Like, <laughs> Do you have anything we can talk about on here? I have one thing that I can talk about, and I think it's crucial. What about yourself? Uh, I mean, I could, you know me. I could always invent something. Uh, I could, if you didn't tell me, if you sent me a video of Willie Moscone running 526 balls, I could talk about, you know, the key ball on 379. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, let's take a look, Chris. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm actually going to take the reins on this one here because of all the pool coaching lesson videos that I've done. The one thing that I haven't commented on for you is your break until now, because here you decided to do a head on break where on the last two racks, you did a second ball break. But I can't say one thing about that, though, is I'm surprised you did a second ball break from the box, basically being two diamonds up and one diamond over. I'm just used to seeing that the cue ball would be all the way over here where you actually have a burn mark on your table. So on your first two racks, I'm just surprised that since you were doing a second ball break, you didn't just break from here from the rail because that probably would have allowed you to hit the second ball fuller. Therefore, the cue ball doesn't end up behind the rack the way that it did. But enough about that. I really want to emphasize on this break here because if we look at how you're queuing, we can see that it looks like you're going to put a lot of draw on this cue ball. But for some reason, you're indicating that you're going to hit a little bit above center on the cue ball. And there's only one way that you can actually do that with the way that you're queuing, which me personally is what I don't like to see. And that's your cue basically flying up into the air and where you're doing like this kind of dive bomber motion in order to be able to come up and actually strike the cue ball where you actually want to strike the cue ball. In my opinion, just all kinds of things could go wrong. You could actually not dive bomb high enough to where you are starting below center and you still hit below center or you end up going too high on the cue ball and putting top spin or you just flat out skip over the cue ball altogether and you end up miscuing. Fortunately for you though, when you did this break, it looks like your cue ball was going to squat right in the center of the table. It just got kicked by the two ball and then lands where it lands here. Me, personally, if you know that you're going to hit slightly above center on the cue ball, I just think that your tip should start slightly above center on the cue ball, pull the cue straight back, and just launch it straight forward without any type of dive bombing or bowing motion that you could ever have. Because more importantly, you just want to make sure that you do strike that cue ball where you intend to strike it. Demetrius, do you have anything you would add to that? Uh, no, I think you cover that well. Um, you know, Chris has uh, helped me a lot with my break and I've learned a lot about the importance of these things when it comes to, you know, tip accuracy and delivery and just, you know, increasing what we ask for from ourselves. Uh, of course, we just want to make a ball and get a shot, but that's the result that we got to really focus on the process. And so he's, uh, he's, he's demanding, but he's, he's given me good, good advice on the break and I appreciate it. Uh, I actually have another point, uh, point I wanted to point out right after the break. Okay, cool. Let's go take a look at it. All right. So I was just looking at this opening shot here, uh, the 12, well, whatever, the stripe in the corner. And so on a rack like this, he broke up so well. Everything's wide open. I'm just like, salivating. I want to run all the balls. Uh, I'm just asking myself, like, what's the, you know, what's the spot? If there's anything that could go wrong, where would it be? And the only thing that I could even invent would be 
something goes wrong on the first shot where you don't get a second shot. Now, I can't see for sure. So when I'm looking at this camera, I can't see for sure. You might have it set to where if you stop dead, you've got this ball and this ball. As played, you you kind of stopped around there and shot the 14. So maybe maybe my sense of danger is unjustified. Maybe there's maybe you already mapped it all out and there's just nothing that could have gone wrong here. But if there was any chance to, for example, where um, if the cue ball bounced the rail and dribbled beyond the 11, or if it if it rocked, you know, if somehow you hit the outside of the pocket, it rocked half an inch to your right and got beyond the 11. If there's any spot around there that if you landed would end your run then it's something I would have been really aware of. And I might've chosen a different way of playing this. For example, uh, shooting it with like a firm center and just punching forward a little bit down to here, some which way, um, or, or even, you know, I don't really like drawing back length of the table, but if there was any chance of getting hooked, I could even draw back a little bit to where I've got the 15, nine on the side, uh, 10 on the corner, things like this. So I will assume that you already did all this and that there was really no spot that you could, end up in and then you're using a stop shot which is extremely high percentage and you knew that you'd have either the 14 or the uh, 15 but for but i can't I, I don't have the luxury of being at the table so i'll assume you had that all considered uh so really i uh, just wanted to let people know pay attention to like when you have a rack like this all you have to do is make sure you don't end up in the dead zones and you you will run out so well andrew this is what demetrius and i have for you after these three fan freaking tastic racks that you were able to run you broke and ran the first two racks and then you racked and ran the last rack and of all the things you would think how could we possibly critique anybody that basically just runs the table well hopefully the stuff that we were able to point out after just digging really deep basically nitpicking a whole lot which for a player like yourself even for myself and even for demetrius I think that's just what it takes. It comes to a whole lot of micromanaging to where on some of those racks, they were actually difficult runouts, and we want to try to turn them into easier runouts. They're never going to be the easiest, because if they were the easiest, we would be pros. But hopefully, at least with the advice that we were able to give you, you can actually use it and apply it to any of your future games. Demetrius, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, that's, that's well said. I've kind of looked at it this way, is that you know, the first half of somebody's pool career, they're, they're learning new shots and getting better at those shots. And so it's always about learning more shots and getting better at those shots. And whether it's getting better at pocketing the balls or learning new ways to move the cue ball, like you demonstrated quite a few, you know, that stun shot and the low inside spin shots and, 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 you know, your, your knowledge of how to maneuver the cue ball around, you demonstrated that you've developed a lot of these shots. The problem is that there's only so far you can develop them. So then once you get to the level where you're at, then improvement from this spot is only, you can't really get that much better at shooting low inside two railers and thin cuts up the side rail. The only ways that you're going to get better is finding ways to not use those hard shots and only use easier shots with more care. Um, so in other words, if you have a, a toolbox where you have a bunch of 95% shots, and then you have a few 75% shots. If you're just like, well, I've got this whole toolbox. I can do whatever I want. And you start, you know, if you use two 75% tools, a rack, that's 50, 50, which means that there's going to be days that you run out three racks in a row. And then there's going to be days when three times in a row, one of those shots goes wrong. Uh, and, and, and on average, it's going to be somewhere in between. So, so the, the best way to get consistent at the high level, is not you're never going to sit there and practice those 75 percent tools until they they're always going to work so the you have to start asking how can i stick to runouts that only use 95 percent tools and that really is going to come up at the beginning of the rack planning your run out more carefully and not just saying hey i've got this big toolbox what me worry you know alfred e newman you can't do that you have to be more demanding now as it turns out you ran out three really good racks and i really mean it the first rack got tricky and then you executed really well to bail yourself out of it. And then the next two racks, you increasingly played tighter cue ball, tighter patterns. Uh, you made some great shots. I'm a big, I'm a big Andrew fan. Uh, I just would love to help you get it so that you're basically doing what you did in rack three, where everything was easy and routine and being able to do that, even on the congested layouts where everything looks tricky, being able to make it look just as easy. 
Well, awesome. Before we bring this video to a close, Demetrius, why don't you go ahead and give yourself a plug for the boot camp? Thank you, Chris. Yes, uh, for those that uh, want to follow, check it out or give me a message, you can reach out to me, uh, mnpoolbootcamp.com. You can email me, info at mnpoolbootcamp.com, or reach out to me on Facebook. And um, I'm happy to help you get your pool game the way you've always wanted it. I think that this game is too awesome to spend your life and not play the way you want to. So let's make it happen. Well, fantastic. So Demetrius, thank you for joining me for uh, this episode of Pool Coaching Lessons. Uh, so viewers, you know, like I always like to say, based on opinions and advice that I gave, based on opinions and advice that Demetrius gave, are there any points that you agree or disagree with? Because if there is something else that you feel that could be added to Andrew's game, then feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below with the timestamp of the shot and the advice that you'd like to give. And if you like what you saw, then please give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Take care, everybody.